the talk, The Ecology of Spider Sociality, a Spatial Model. Hi, everybody. Can you see the screen and hear me? We All can right? see it. Great. Okay. So today I'd like to talk about the work that I did this past year in collaboration with colleagues from the Center for Ecological Research, the Institute of Evolution in Budapest, Hungary. And this is work that we have currently in revision at the American Naturalist. So as you know, most spiders are solitary, but a few have evolved cooperative social behavior. These species are phylogenetically diverse with convergent social behaviors, which include uh, cooperation in building and maintaining a communal web, cooperation in prey capture, feeding, and communal brood care. In the social species, the individuals remain together throughout their life and they produce new generations of offspring that continue to occupy the same web. So these nests contain multiple mothers, last for many generations, and depending on the species and the region may contain hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of spiders. For our purposes, it's interesting that in, in the same genera where we have these social species, they are related less social species, either solitary or subsocial. The subsocial species in particular are interesting because these consist of groups of the mother and the offspring. They remain together for a while, but the offspring disperse prior to reproduction. So these colonies contain only a few dozen individuals. So a question that we may ask is what explains the diversity of the spider social systems and their geographical distribution? Regarding the geographical distribution, we have documented that the social species are concentrated in the tropical areas of the world. So we have these different species here belonging to five families where social spiders have originated. Within the tropics, they also are concentrated in the lower elevations. And in this case, for the genus Anelosimus, they are concentrated in the lower elevation wet tropics. So the social species here in this genus are shown with the red dots and the subsocial with blue dots. And we see these interesting patterns that the subsocial species, they are sort of exclusive distributions, are found at the higher elevations and higher latitudes, but they are absent from the lowland tropics or the wet tropics. Whereas the social species, on the other hand, are absent from the higher elevations and latitudes, and they are instead found in the lowland tropical rainforests for the most part. So the two patterns that we patterns that we wish to explain is why are the subsocial species absent from the lowland tropical rainforest? And the hypothesis that we have posed is that it is the disturbance caused by intense rains and predation that exclude them or, uh, from the um, lowland tropical rainforest. So we have documented that the intensity of rain, so how rain, how hard it rains during a period of time, and the rate of predation both decline with elevation. And these things are relevant uh, because uh, the spiders in the genera that have given rise to the social species build these dense uh, three-dimensional webs that are presumably costly. So if they're in a place where they are frequently damaged by strong rains, they would not be able to maintain these web in, webs in good condition unless the work of maintaining them is shared by multiple females. And likewise, in, in areas of high predation, they would be better off if multiple females are available to look after the offspring, even in the situation where the mother may have died. The other pattern uh, that we need to explain is why are the social species excluded from these higher elevations and higher latitudes and restricted to the lower elevation wet tropics. And here we suggest that it is the size of the insects present in those environments that are responsible for these. And specifically that there is an absence of large insects at the higher elevations and higher latitudes where the social species are absent. So we here see here the distribution of insect sizes from low to high elevation decreases and the higher insect size categories are missing from that high elevation but present in the lowland rainforest. And we refer to these as the prey size hypothesis. And the explanation for why insect size matters is because of this three-dimensional scaling of their webs, which as 3D objects, they as they grow in size, the surface doesn't grow as fast as the volume. The number of insects intercepted by the colony should be proportional to the surface, but the amount of resources needed should be proportional to the volume. So as a result of these, the number of insects per capita should be a decreasing function of colony size. And we see this 
both uh, happening for the subsurface species at a high elevation, cloud forest area, and for the social species in the lowland tropical rainforest. However, for a species in the lowland tropical rainforest, given that there are large insect sizes available in that habitat, they are able to cooperatively capture increasingly larger insects as colony size increases. And as a result, you have uh, the product of fewer insects, but larger insects and biomass per capita here peaks at some intermediate colony size. But if you are at this higher elevation area where these large insect size classes are missing, now biomass per capita declines with colony size, colony size here about 100 only, which would explain why they disperse before they produce a new generation of offspring. So these are the patterns that we wanted to reproduce uh, in a simulation model. So this is a specially explicit model. And in this case, we are looking at the habitats from high elevation to low elevation as the size of the prey increases from very small insects at the higher elevations to the largest insects in the lowland tropical rainforest. So we have 10 different environments with increasing insect size and also at the same time, an increase in the amount of disturbance. So the greatest disturbance again happening in the lowland tropical rainforest. Now we model the organisms and their response to these uh, abiotic and biotic factors. So we have number of insects per capita decline with colony size. The size of the prey increases with colony size, but then this again depends on the habitat. And so this increase happens only in the areas where there are large insects available. Again here, biomass number of prey per capita times their size gives us biomass per capita, which has a peak at some intermediate colony size. Now to calculate the number of offspring produced, we also need to take into account the damage and the cost of the damage produced by rains or predators. And so this is the fourth function here showing that the damage, the, so is, this is the, how well the colonies recover from the damage, depends on colony size, the larger colonies do better. And of course the damage is greatest in the lowland tropical rainforest. So we calculate uh, number of offspring as the uh, biomass per capita times the size of the colony minus the damage produced in the colonies. And so we want to test the hypothesis with this spatial model, the gradients of insect size and disturbance limit the distribution of social and subsocial spiders. And we asked the question whether these gradients are sufficient and necessary to explain the observed patterns. So in our simulation, we have a grid of a thousand spaces times 100 for 10 different environments. We colonize the grid with either social and subsocial spiders, a mixture of both of those. Uh, the subsocials disperse every generation and they do not join each other at the time of dispersal, so they remain solitary as in the actual system. The social species, on the other hand, they disperse with probability less than one and only when the colonies are of a relatively large size. They do join siblings at the moment of dispersal or they may disperse together. And if dispersal fails, in the case of the social species, the colony may go extinct. And so we calculate at each of the sites occupied by one of these species, the amount of resources available depending on the habitat and the offspring that they will produce in each site. And the offspring then recolonize the grid, the parental generation dies off, and we repeat this process until some equilibrium is reached, which actually was rich in less than 100 generations, but we ran the simulations for a thousand generations. And at equilibrium, this is what we observe. So he, here we have a uh, depiction of the spatial grid with a higher elevation habitat here at the, on the left and the lowland rainforest on the right. Uh, Subsocial species here is represented by the purple color. And we see here that the higher elevation is occupied by the subsocial species. Intermediate elevations, there is a mixture of both social systems. The subsocial species, on the other hand, here, they range in size depending on the habitat from very small colonies from to very large colonies. And the largest colonies happen in the lowland rainforest, which replicates exactly the pattern that we observe in the actual system. So it appears that these gradients of insect size and disturbance that we have along this grid are sufficient to explain observed patterns. Now the question is whether these gradients are necessary. So for this, we do some experiments. We, here's the, the simulation that I showed you before. Now we are going to maintain the distribution of uh, this disturbance magnitudes along the grid, but we are gonna put small prey everywhere. 
And the prediction based on the precise hypothesis is that the social species will be excluded from the areas where they occur because of the in the absence of these large insects. And this is exactly what we see here. Now we do the opposite of experiment, we put large prey everywhere. Another prediction would be that the social the species would do better, it would take over the grid presumably because it doesn't care that there is low disturbance at a high elevation and it can take advantage and not compete presumably the subsocial species there. And this is minutes. what we see, thank you. So in with large prey everywhere, the social species takes over the landscape. Now, so based on these results, a prey size grading is necessary to explain the pattern. What about disturbance? So in this case, we maintain prey size gradient as before, and now we run an experiment by putting first high disturbance everywhere. And the prediction now would be that the subsocial species would be excluded from the habitat where it currently occur because of high disturbance. And so we run the simulation, high disturbance everywhere, and that is exactly what happens. Not only that the subsocial species is excluded from the higher elevations, but the social species with the small colonies is also excluded from the intermediate elevations. Now we run the opposite experiment. We put low disturbance everywhere. And the prediction now is that the subsocial species presumably would do better because there is small insects everywhere and now disturbance is also low everywhere. And so this is the pattern that we observe. And it, the subsocial species didn't actually quite take over, which is quite interesting. And we see a pattern that quite resembles the original pattern. So this suggests that a, a spectrum of disturbances is not necessary to explain the pattern. But let me show you that some disturbance is necessary for the pattern to be there. So now we run the simulation, same uh, setting in terms of prey size as before, but now we have no disturbance everywhere. And this is what we get. We have this really interesting situation now that the subsocial species is now taken over the lowest elevations where the large social colonies used to be. And this process gets even more extreme uh, if we reduce the cost of producing one offspring. So the subsocial species seems to be taken over when there is no disturbance. So what is going on here? To understand what's going on, now we can look at the per capita number of offspring produced by the social species in these different habitats. So we have an intermediate elevation habitat going down to the lowland rainforest where disturbance and prey size are the largest. And we see that in the presence of disturbance, the very small colonies are not doing well. This is what is known as an Ali effect, which would give an advantage to colonies of intermediate size and some larger sizes. However, if we take away disturbance, now that Ali effect goes away and the smallest colonies now have the highest fitness. Basically, without no disturbance, with no disturbance, they, there is no longer a benefit for being in groups. And the other pattern that happens is now we are going to look at the distribution of colony sizes. We have a number of colonies of different sizes here on a log scale. And here in the lowest elevation habitat where the insects are largest with no disturbance, we see that there is unstable colony dynamics of the social species, which if this, as we ex explained earlier, if dispersal fails will sort of lead to extinction of the, those colonies which is what may explain this unstable dynamics, why these lower habitats are now taken over by the subsocial species, which now would do well with no disturbance in those habitats. So with that, I'd like to sort of just summarize the conclusions. Prey size and disturbance gradients are sufficient to explain observed patterns. A prey size gradient is necessary, but a disturbance gradient is not. However, disturbance is necessary to create the conditions that favor group living and to stabilize the dynamics of social groups where prey are large. And the take home message from this talk is that geographical patterns in the distribution of animal social systems may reflect relatively simple underlying processes. And I would suggest not just in spiders, but in many other social organisms. In the case of the spiders in the genus Anelosimus, parallel gradients of insect size and disturbance may explain not just where, but also why they are social and disturbance may play a role both favoring and maintaining group living. And this last result is actually something that 
we hadn't anticipated and we found actually quite interesting and exciting. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge again, my collaborators in Hungary, the social spiders that have inspired this work, funding from Can Canadian and Hungarian sources. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leticia. I, sorry, but we don't have time for a question now, but you can answer in the chat if you will. And now